and I work at Waterville Crates. I'm the programming and outreach manager. Um, and uh, the classroom that is attending today is uh, Jessica Hamilton Jones's classroom at the main, um, at the Waterville Alternative High School. So welcome to them. And, and um, they have awesome little kits that were put together by Sarah Taylor at the Waterville Public Library. So um, today's uh, SLICE, which stands for Students Learning Innovative and Creative Endeavors. Um, today's SLICE is all about painting game miniatures, which I'm super excited about. It's not a thing I know a ton about, um, but I have a sister who is like the biggest D&D &D, um, fan ever and um, always in the middle of painting miniatures and um, on campaigns and it's kind of great. So um, we are gonna record this. Uh, oh, I see there's a nice chat, Jessica and the classroom say hello. Awesome, hey Jessica. Um, so uh, I think I'd love to introduce Sarah Taylor. So Sarah Taylor is, um, uh, Sarah, I'm not sure if you're the teen. I don't know if your your um, title has changed actually. Oh, um, right. technically, uh, technically now I'm the adult and teen services librarian. That's why I thought it changed a little bit. That's awesome. Um, so Sarah, I'll let you take it away. And you could even tell us if you'd like about um, why you chose this subject, because I think it's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, hi, so today we're gonna be painting, learning how to paint uh, miniatures for role-playing games with Rachel Moore, who works at the State Library. Um, Rachel, at the Maine State Library, sorry. Uh, Rachel um, at, before the pandemic um, was running a D&D game um, at the library for some homeschool kits that went really well. Um, she also DMs her own campaign um, and has a D&D &D podcast um, called Freelance Heroism um, and it paints um, a lot of minis uh, for fun and for games. Um, and I just Thought it would be a really cool thing for us um, to do today together because it's a good it's a good skill to learn. Um, it they're very tiny and it's really hard. Um, <laughs> and D and D can uh, be useful in in a variety of different ways in your life, whether it's for work or for fun. Um, and it's just it's just very good. But anyway, so um, I guess I'll turn over to, to Rachel now and we, cause you should all have uh, paints and minis and everything in your kits um, and she'll tell you how to get started with that. Okay. Uh, so hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Rachel Moore. Um, so I moved to Maine and started working at the Maine State Library about five years ago. Uh, originally I am from Texas. So uh, the weather that you guys have is very different from what I'm used to, but it's it's very nice um and actually about five years ago is when i started really getting into painting miniatures um the uh and if anyone has any questions you know please please feel free to chime in at any point um but i have always been really into uh role-playing games i started with pathfinder and uh moved to dungeons and dragons after that but there's a ton of different types of tabletop role-playing games uh, that need miniatures. Um, and then there's also just sort of like busts that you can paint as well um, for display. I use mine for playing, um, but it's totally valid just to have them for display. Um, I started because I uh, was playing a game and I wanted a mini to represent my character and none of the pre-painted ones were really how I envisioned my character. Um, but when you paint your own, uh, you can really customize it. If you want one with like a certain color hair, you want their armor to look a certain way uh, by painting it yourself, you can really get that customization. And sometimes it's easier to find minis that represent certain monsters um, and find them unpainted. And that's a lot easier than finding them pre-painted. Um, I did bring a few, actually, let me see if I can so I was going to share my screen uh, just to show some of the ones I've painted before. Uh, so this one, I let me make sure 
Uh, can you guys see that one okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good, good. I just want to make sure before I start talking about it to make sure there's something on the screen. Uh, so this is like a kind of, you know, weird little buggy guy. Uh, this was actually for a, um, a painting contest at my local uh, gaming store. Uh, and um, they just had a contest for people to submit their own painted miniatures and you could get some little prizes and stuff. Um, and I wanted to do something more creative than just painting him and, and throwing on some basing here. So if you can see his mouth, uh, it looks really gross. And that was actually uh, done on purpose. Um, you can see like the sort of stringy spit on him. And um, what I did to do that was that I uh, took some uh, super glue and I put it on like a little piece of paper and I let it almost dry. And then I used a toothpick to sort of stretch it out and put it on his mouth here. And just doing something simple like that, um, you know, with, with very basic materials can give you a really cool and interesting effect. Um, this is a uh, this is a little beholder, which is uh, basically a big meatball with an eye in the middle. Um, there's another, they come in all kinds of different varieties. Um, actually, I've got a different kind that I was gonna paint uh, in a little bit to show you guys um, that is sort of appropriately spooky. Uh, Rachel, what's the game yes. store nearest you? Uh, the one I go to a lot is called Game On. It's in Augusta. Mm. Um, so they have a lot of different, uh, they have like a big wall of different minis uh, that you can pick from. Um, and I buy a lot of them there. And I also get my minis from either Kickstarters uh, or just going online to different uh, shops and ordering through there. Um, from what I understand, uh, the you guys at the classroom have, um, I think, Reaper Bones brand, um, which is a fantastic starter brand. I have a ton of Reaper Bones minis, um, and they're really good to start off with. Cool, thanks. I was just curious about the game stores, you know, that are close to us. <laughs> oh yeah, there is also another one in Augusta. Um, called Greenhouse Games. Uh, I don't go there as often just because uh, Game On is very close to my work. So a lot of times after work, uh, I will go to the game store. <laughs> um, this was another one I painted and I just tried to do like a little kind of glowy effect on the sword. Um, this guy has sort of a Herman Munster look to him, uh, but he's got a big heavy coat. Uh, and if you look at his, um, his sword, uh, what I tried to do here is a technique called non-metallic metal, where you don't use any shiny paint, um, you just use regular paint and you try to give it an effect as though it were shiny. Uh, it's very difficult to achieve, uh, but I do try to practice it when I can. Uh, this guy, I really, I really like. Um, so as you can see, he's got like this sort of bumpy, rusty bits on him um, that wasn't from the the model itself um there is actually i actually have um some uh sort of like gritty paste it's like a texture paste and uh what i wanted to do and with a lot of minis when i paint them is that i try to figure out if they have a little bit of a story to them to give them character and what i mean by that is that when i looked at this guy his armor was very clean but he, you know he's got a big skull so in my mind, he was sort of buried in the ground for a while. And if that's the case, why would his armor be smooth? So I wanted to give him a sort of rusty effect. So I took some texture paste and dabbed it on, and then I just painted it orange and yellow um, as, though it were, as though it were rusting. And I thought that would, um, you know, just give him some extra character uh, for, you know, not, not a lot of effort, but I think it, it really, tells you more about this guy just from doing that little bit there. Um, I really like this, uh, this lady. Uh, she is um, just sort of an owlbear creature. She's actually going to show up in a, a campaign that I'm running for some friends right now, um, which if they were here, they would get to see like a little, a little preview of it. But uh, I guess it'll be a surprise for them later. Rachel, I, uh, there's a question in the in the chat. The classroom missed what your job is. Um, oh, sure. Um, and yeah, and do you ever make money painting minis? Was the other part of the question? So, what's your job? Okay. And, yeah. Uh, so my job 
is um, I am a librarian generalist at the Bain State Library in Augusta. Uh, I work um, in several different places in, in the library. Uh, I do a lot of my work at the circulation desk. So if you come in to check out a book, I might be there at the desk to help you. Um, I also work in our talking books department. Um, what that is, is that's a statewide program for people who are uh, blind or homebound or something else who maybe can't you know, leave the house freely or can't read a book in a traditional way. So the Talking Books program sends out book players and audiobooks um, for people who may need that sort of assistance uh, in order to be able to read and enjoy books. Uh, it's a wonderful program. And if you know anyone who might need, um, you know, some sort of help like that, uh, it's completely free. You just have to contact the Maine State Library and we can help sign people up for it. Uh, another thing I did at the Maine State Library before the uh, the pandemic hit was that I had a um, a monthly D and D game for some homeschool kids. Uh, it was really really fun, and I actually sort of accidentally fell into that. Um, how I got into that was um, we have a maker space. Uh, at the main state library, or we did before we had to move buildings. And so we would go to um, like different homeschool groups and show off some of, you know, uh, some of the technology that we had in the makerspace and just sort of demo it for these, these different groups. And um, at one point, uh, one of the kids there was talking to a coworker and he mentioned to her uh, that I actually was running a D&D game for them. And so from across this room, I hear uh, this little girl goes, she knows how to play D&D. &D. And this uh, little girl runs over to me and starts very excitedly telling me about her character and how she really wants to play D&D, &D, but she doesn't know anyone who knows how to run a game. And could I please run a game for her and her friends? And I'm not gonna say no to that. Uh, so we started a, um, a monthly game I thought at first that I would uh, just sort of run a few games to give them the idea of how to how to play, um, but it turned into a monthly thing, um, and I got more and more kids from it as they would tell their friends and they would want to play. And so every month they would come to the library. We would order pizza and have some junk food and play. Um, we played Lost Minds of Fandelver, which is a, sort of a starter D and D game. That's pretty fun. And um, they had actually just finished that up and we were about to start a new campaign, but then the, the pandemic hit. And unfortunately we haven't been able to start back up since then, uh, but hopefully we can soon. Um, the other part of the question was, do I make money painting miniatures? Is that right? Yeah, that's the other part. Okay. Um, there are people who do make money uh, painting miniatures. Um, and I have had people uh, who have paid me to, to paint miniatures for them. <laughs> Um, usually as like uh, gifts for um, their their spouse who has a character and um, they they really wanted their spouse to have like a mini to represent their character so they they came to me and asked for help about how to how to pick something and then to paint it with a skill like that uh, it's very important to um, record your progress so what I did was uh, I recorded you know, how much the mini cost, um, how, mu how much it was to ship it to me, and then just how, from what times I would work on painting it. And then I just picked sort of a set charge by the hour amount. Um, I don't professionally, you know, seek out to, to paint minis for people. I, a lot of what I do is just for my own personal fun um, and for games, but it is certainly something that you can do to, um, to, to make money. And there are lots of uh, people who do it professionally and uh, also people who have uh, YouTube channels where they show you, you know, every, every week they make a video showing how to paint minis or explaining a certain technique or something like that. Uh, and there, there are some really great channels out there that I honestly watch all the time. <laughs> um, there's uh, one called Squidmar and he paints a lot of minis. Um, there's Goobertown Hobbies. Uh, he's probably one of my favorite channels. He paints a lot of minis, but he also has a, um, a degree in chemistry. So he'll occasionally 
uh, do videos where he breaks down sort of the chemical compositions of like different types of paints or solvents um, and does experiments on sort of which are more longer lasting um, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but that's that's a great channel as well. Um, Miniac's also really good. He does he does a lot of a lot of mini painting. Maybe Rachel, we could even um, at the end mm -hmm. some of the suggestions we could like either put them in the chat or I can send them on to the classroom. Oh yeah, that's, absolutely. That's so awesome. I know that my sister like watches Twitch too mm -hmm. as a as a, a resource. Um, yeah. And then she uses Instagram and follows some of those some of the mini painter miniature painters on Instagram. So that'd be cool. Yeah, there's some really amazing. I mean, it's it's honestly you know, you're making art and it's, it's just really amazing to see the sort of things that, that other people come up with and the creativity that they have. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a, a really, when I started doing it, I, I didn't, I just wanted to, you know, have figures to represent people or monsters in my games. Um, but the more I got into it, the more I learned about color theory, the more I learned about like muscular structure and how the light hits um, on surfaces, depending on the angle that it comes from, you learn about um, how does light reflect depending on the material that it's shining on. So there's a lot that can really go into it that you that you can learn about. And it's honestly, it's very interesting. Uh, this is a little undead guy that I did. Uh, he's got very long toes, which I think are kind of creepy. <laughs> Um, this was really interesting. You can't see him too well. One of the things that um, painting minis has helped me with is sort of thinking creatively. Um, with this wolf right here, uh, if you look on his nose, uh, the sculpt itself, like the actual mold of this this wolf, um, there was uh, it just didn't mold properly on his nose, so it looked kind of funky. Um, and instead of just trying to ignore it or trying to fix it, which I think would have been really difficult, I decided that instead I would just paint it as though this it were like a little scar on his nose. Uh, and I think that gave him a lot of character that he wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, but it's it's nice to sort of have that kind of freedom uh, when you're painting things and and adapt and you know, again, it tells like a little bit of a story about this wolf and how he must have gotten into a fight and it put a put a scar on his nose. Uh, this is just a big ogre that I thought um, sometimes painting a lot of skin can be difficult because uh, skin isn't all just one color. You know, when you think about it, it's uh, depending on like the shadows, maybe they've got scars or sunburns or, you know, maybe like their belt is pushing into their stomach or something like that. And it's um, it helps you think a lot about just anatomy and, and figures and stuff like that. Uh, this was a lady I got, um, actually a, a company sent me, um, a couple of minis and asked me to, to paint them if I would promote their Kickstarter. So this was one of the ones that I did. I thought she was pretty neat. Uh, this was just a, uh, creepy, like, sarcophagus, um, and when I started painting it, uh, I had thought about just making it gray, but the base that it's on is already gray, and I didn't want it to be just a big gray box, uh, but it's got sort of a demonic look to it. So I thought, why not make it red and just really, really lean into like, hey, this is a creepy sarcophagus, you know? Oh, other than painting minis themselves, um, the, the bases, you can do a lot with that, um, which really gives it a lot of character. Uh, I was painting a, um, a mini that was a big frost giant. And rather than just having a big blank base, I wanted it to look like he was sort of on um, like ice or something like that. So uh, this was a really easy technique um, with the, the sort of blue crackly stuff. There's a um, like a type of paste that uh, a paint company makes. And once it dries, depending on how thick you put it down, it does these different types of crackles. Um, so I thought it, it could very easily look like broken ice. So I just painted it blue and then um, I used a technique called dry brushing, which is really just putting a little bit of paint on your brush and then very lightly going over your surface. So that way you're not completely coating it. You're just sort of getting all the raised parts and doing that with white to give it this sort of bumpy broken ice effect. 
Uh, this was a unicorn that I painted for a friend for her birthday. Uh, she had a unicorn themed birthday party. Um, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't sure what to, what to get her as a present because I didn't know what she had and what she didn't have, but I figured she didn't have a hand painted unicorn miniature. Um, so I went for this effect, uh, again, working on the, um, the broken ice effect for the base. Uh, and then, so I painted the rock as though it were a big chunk of ice and then gave it this sort of silky kind of golden look to it. Uh, there are tons of like weird different kinds of miniatures that you can find. Um, so this was just like a little acorn with legs and I just thought he was really cool. And it, I was able to paint him very quickly. Um, but there's a ton of creativity for different types of sculpts. Um, and also if you look at like 3D printing, um, there are lots of different 3D models of very creative minis that are out there that if you have like a 3D printer, you can just buy the file and print it yourself. Um, oh, and there's my frost giant for the, the base and um, a regular size player mini for, for scale. So there's really a size difference that you can go with with these. Um, obviously the, the big frost giant took longer to paint. <laughs> But I was pretty happy with them once he was once he was done. So what I was gonna do uh, is uh, do a little bit of a painting demo. I'm not gonna be able to finish this uh, in the next 20 to 25 minutes. Um, but I thought we could sort of go over, kind of paint together a little bit. If anyone has questions while we're painting, please feel free to ask. Um, let me switch my camera over. Rachel, on yes average do you have a, a like how long a, a mini will take you can you you know I guess it depends on the size and all that but it does depend on the size and then um part of it too is sort of uh some of the paints um there's a brand of paints called contrast paints that uh are meant to uh be like a kind of one coat or two coat where you don't have to use too many um different colors um, but for something like, um, like this lady, see if I can get focus on her, um, like she would maybe take me, um, like, I don't know, a few hours, not a lot, maybe like four or five hours. Usually I break it up, uh, over the, over like a few days. Rachel, even your surface is cool. <laughs> what you're using. This your was touch. a um, uh, this was a birthday gift somebody got for me, and I just I love like the the image on it. I'm a big HP uh, Lovecraft fan, and um, so this was sort of in that in that vein. Uh, someone asked about mini holders. So there's a couple of different things you can use. So like uh, this sort of handle, I bought this. Um, and then I've just got some poster tack underneath here uh, to keep her on the, the base. Um, so you can use these, or if you don't want to go out and buy something, which is perfectly valid. Uh, what I used for a long time was like uh, empty paint bottles or like old pill bottles. And you can sort of weigh them down if you put like sand or rocks inside of them and then give it like some weight and then just use poster tack to, to keep your mini. Um, what I've got here was the one I thought I would paint a little bit since it is it is spooky season and the sky uh, is very Halloween festive <laughs> and he's on his own little base. Uh, this is a jack-o'-lantern beholder. So um, a beholder is a type of monster in D&D. It's a big eyeball and he's got like little eyeballs sort of radiating out from him. Uh, but I thought he was really, I thought it was really funny and sort of appropriate for um, for today. Um, but I've got him on double-sided tape, uh, just because with the bigger minis, it's harder, I think, for the poster tack to keep them on. So I just bought some little double-sided tape from Amazon to, to use, and so he'll peel off really easily. Um, when you paint minis, uh, I know the Reaper Bones, you don't have to prime them. Um, and priming is where you just sort of, uh, like with this guy, I just use a spray paint. 
um, but there's also like a canvas primer. I used this for a long time um, and it's basically just to help the paint stick better to the figure. But like I said, with the Reaver Bones, you don't, as long as the paint you're using isn't too watered down, um, you don't have to prime it. You might hear my cat in the background. He thinks I'm talking to him. <laughs> Um, so some tools that you need other than maybe something to and to hold on to the mini like with the base this way I don't have to like actually touch it while I'm painting it because I don't want to smear the paint, you know you have oils on your on your hands so um, whatever I can do to lessen sort of interfering with the paint, all the better. Um, you also need a palette to actually hold your paint. Uh, this is a wet palette. You don't have to have this. Um, you can just use, you know, like a paper plate with your paint on it. Uh, but what a wet palette is, is that there's a, um, like a sponge underneath. And then I've got like a little like parchment paper, basically. Um, and this just sort of helps keep the paint that I put on top of it kind of moist so it doesn't dry out too quickly. Um, but you don't need this unless you're painting a lot. Um, I try to paint, you know, at least a few nights a week. Um, my cat is still talking to me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but um, so that's what I use. But again, you don't you don't need something like that. Um, one thing you do need is just like a cup of water. Um, for the longest time, I just used an old like plastic cup. Uh, this is like a slightly fancy brush cleaner in that it has this sort of metal coil about halfway down. And that's for you to run your brush on top of so that way it helps get the paint and then the paint goes underneath the coils to help kind of keep the top half of the water more clear. And of course you need uh, paints. Uh, I picked some out from here. Um, a lot of the paints I use, I bought like a big bulk from a uh, Reaper, um, which I guess I, I get a lot of my stuff from Reaper, I think. Uh, part of it is just, you know, they are, um, they are tech from Texas. And again, I am, I am also from Texas. So I guess I feel a little bit of that loyalty, but, uh, these are great paints. You don't have to water them down too much, uh, depending on the brand. Sometimes you have to add more water than with others. Um, but I think they have a great, a great variety. And I've got my brushes. Um, so when you are painting a mini, um, one of the things you want to do, uh, and I know this will sound silly, is that you want to look at your mini before you start painting it. And what I mean by that is that you just sort of look it over to get an idea of what's actually on it and what kind of color scheme you're going to go for. Um, there's been so many times where I haven't really looked too closely at a mini that I started painting. And then as I'm painting, I'm like, oh, I didn't realize it had like, you know, a sword on its belt. I didn't realize it had this bag over here. I don't know what color I'm going to paint these things now. Um, so really just looking at your mini, getting an idea of how you want to paint it, um, what color scheme you're going for is a great way to start out. Um, another thing is that when you are painting, um, you want to paint from the inside out. And what I mean by that is that you want to paint um, you know, like if they have a jacket, but you can see their hands, you want to paint your hand, their hands before you paint their jacket. Um, it makes it easier to go over any mistakes, which, you know, don't worry about sort of painting outside of the lines because you can always cover it up later. Uh, and also, especially with tabletop gaming, um, you know, when you're using these minis to play, you're not going to have it right up on your face. It's going to be three, four feet away from you on the table. So any like really bad mistakes, honestly, people probably aren't even going to notice. Uh, so I try to remind myself of that. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to stress myself out. You know, this is a hobby. I do this for fun. I don't want to be, I don't want to be under a lot of pressure for my, <laughs> from my hobby. Um, so like with this guy, um, I typically will paint the eyes first since they're sort of more inner and then I will go uh, out to, you know, his little pumpkin body, uh, his teeth. Um, so looking at him, I definitely want orange, you know, um, I certainly want maybe browns and greens for the, uh, the stock here that he's got. Uh, 
for these little guys. Um, I want to get uh, yellows maybe so it looks like they've got lights inside. Um, down here at the base, he's got more pumpkins, uh, but these are kind of Honestly, these look kind of gross. These look like rotten pumpkins. So I think for these, I want to do maybe like a mix together brown and orange. So it looks like they're, you know, sort of on their way out. Uh, he's got a stem. So he doesn't have too many details. If you really think about it, he's just got, you know, the stem, his head. He's got his little eyeball buddies. Uh, so even though he's kind of, he's kind of big, he's going to have a pretty basic uh, color scheme. And um, one thing I can do uh, to try to add like extra different little pops of color, uh, you know, I could give him a really funky eyeball color. Um, with his teeth, you can see his gums a little bit. So maybe I want to add in some pink on his gums just to give it a little bit of an interest. But you don't have to add, you know, you don't want to add every single color to him. You want to sort of have like a coherent color scheme going on. So uh, one of the things that I often do with eyeballs, because I'm going to start with this eyeball first, is um, I'll sort of line it with like a darker color. And I'm just shaking my paint right now. Uh, just to sort of make the eye pop a little bit more. I put way too much brown on my palette. <laughs> uh, let's see. So. Oh, and you probably want to have like a, a just a paper towel to wipe uh, excess water or your paint. So I'm going to put some paint on my paintbrush and then I'm going to wipe a little bit of it off because I don't I don't want too much. Uh, let me see if I can get them in frame. Uh, and so what I'm going to do, and it's OK that I'm being sloppy. It is totally fine. Uh, I'm just sort of lining the corners uh, just because by outlining it, it'll make his eye look more. Um, like more, you know, like you can see his eye better because it's, it's got a little outline on it. And looking at him now, he's got sort of a, like a little, the little corners of his eyes. So maybe I'll also do that in pink, uh, but I might just do in the same pink uh, that I'm doing his gums uh, because it's totally fine to kind of use the same colors because that'll really keep the cohesion for this guy. So for his eyeball, um, one thing is you don't want to use just a stark white. You know, nobody's eye is just a straight white. Um, what I'm going to do is go for an off-white. Uh, this one, it says skeleton bone, but I think we can use it for his eye. And usually with paints, you kind of, the rule generally is that you should have sort of two thin coats, um, and that should be enough to cover what you're doing. You don't want your paint to be, you know, like thick like yogurt, but you don't want it to be, you don't want it to be watery. It has to be sort of somewhere in between. So I'm gonna use a big brush because he has a big eyeball. So this first coat, definitely isn't going to have the kind of coverage that I want. I'm certainly going to have to go in with the second coat. Rachel, do you have to let it dry before you do the second coat? Um, if the paint is thick, then you do want to let it dry. Um, usually what I do if there's uh, like a lot that needs to dry is that I'll just move on to a different part of it to paint. Um, or you can, you know, you can just like blow on it to help it dry. Um, I've seen some mini painters use like, they'll have like uh, hair dryers at their desk and just set it on like a low setting to help dry their minis quickly. That's so cool. Do you also have a, um, uh, like, do you have a magnifying glass that you ever use or you, I don't know. I was just curious. Um, uh I don't, I don't, but um, there are, and one of my friends who, he also paints minis, he has um, like the little glasses with the magnifier. Um, I haven't, I don't have a pair of those. I feel like, you know, maybe when I get older, I might need one, uh, but uh, I don't, I don't have one right now. Um, but certainly like with this, especially if you have a smaller figure, you would, 
you would probably want something like that. Uh, while his eyeball dries, why don't we, uh, I want to break out this pink. Maybe we can paint his gums a little bit. And Rachel, just so you know, the classroom has already, they've, they've been diving in already. Oh, <laughs> and good. They sent me some progress photos, so I will send you some of those at some oh, point. Oh, yes, this is, please. This is great because I think as you paint, they'll get some tips on how to, you know, Mm -hmm. Not, you know like the eyeball tip is a good one like stuff like that as they go it's yeah so cool. there is um and I can show it actually yeah why don't I show I'll show it on one of the um one of the little pumpkin head guys um so typically when you are painting something um you want sort of like if there are if they have like a cape and there are folds in the cape or um you know, just natural folds and cloth or like how this guy has the, uh, you know, the little like ridges in his little pumpkin body. Um, typically folds like that or things that are underneath, um, those are gonna be darker because you wanna consider, you know, where is the light coming from? And typically with minis, you just sort of assume that the light is above them, maybe like off to one side. So anything, you know, like in the recesses is gonna be darker and things that are, um, you know, closer to the top or closer to the light source, those will be a little bit brighter. Um, so like with this guy, when I paint him, oh, uh, you know, I'll probably do like these little folds darker. Um, however, that's not the case when you're painting things that have a light source. Um, if you look at light or you look at fire, um, it's brighter on the inside and it gets darker on the outside, uh, which is, completely opposite to how how else you might you might paint your mini um so like with these little pumpkin guys um I would do probably like the very center of their eyes like a bright yellow and then as it went out I would deepen it to like an orange or a red um, but for light sources like if um example she's got like a little lantern in her if I can get it to focus uh she has a little lantern on her staff. Um, and so I would paint like the very center of the lantern, uh, like a bright yellow. And then as I went out, I would deepen it to, to orange um, because, you know, the brightest part is going to be the flame in the center. So let's take one of these little pumpkin guys. Uh, We'll go with this guy up here. So what I'm gonna do, um, I'm starting with the inner part. So I'm starting with his little eyeballs cause that's, you know, on the inside I'm gonna do his nose. And uh, I'm not worried about staying in the lines because I'm just gonna paint over that part with orange when I get to the rest of his body. He keeps falling off space. I'm going to hold him for a second. And also, with, because I'm doing a light source, you know, he's sort of, uh, it's coming out of the lines a little bit. But honestly, you could also leave that since the light would be spilling out of him anyway. But I just want to on here to start. There's also a really cool technique uh, in mini painting uh, and it's called kit bashing. And what that is, is um, if you took maybe a couple minis and you like the head on one, but you don't like the head on the other, you could swap them out. Um, I've seen people do this for just different minis that are like the same size. I've seen people take like uh, little action figures from the dollar store and change them up. Um, and it just gives you like a whole new uh, gateway into creativity or, you know, just if you don't have a lot of resources, something like that, it's a, it's a really cool way to be, just to be creative and, and do something different. All right, I'm gonna let his, 
little eyeballs dry and um, looks like the main eyeball here is dry now. So I'm gonna add a second coat. You can see that's pretty good and you can see definitely there is like a an off white versus the white of the rest of his body that's been spray painted so there's definitely a difference there um, typically you don't ever want to go for like a stark white um, because that can kind of read as it's not painted um, actually not too long ago i painted a white dragon i don't know how well she'll she'll be in frame um, and it was actually surprisingly difficult because I didn't want to just do plain white because then she's not going to look like she's painted. So I decided to take some light grays. You can see she's got some blues. There's some very light purple. And um, you know, you want to highlight those up to white, um, but you don't want it to be just a flat white because then, you know, that looks that looks a little boring. Uh, also, I, I put this against my players a few weeks ago. They were level four and uh, they had to run away from her. It was, it was a very fun game. Rachel, it's one of the things I realized as an artist that one of the things you learn is like hardly anything's really true white. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Like it has shadow and color in it. Like mm -hmm. when people paint snow, it's like, well, there's blue and purple and yeah. It's nice. Right. Yeah. So let's see. I kind of want to give him, let's see, I don't want to give him a red eye because I'm going to do some sort of like little red in the corners of his eyes, like little veins. So maybe I'll give him a big green eye. Uh, so we don't want uh, to just do like a flat green. Uh, so what we can do is I'm going to start with my mid-tone and your mid-tone is kind of what you want the overall color to read as. Uh, so I'm going to go with kind of a medium green. This is a Naga green, but really, you know, just any color you want. And with uh, smaller minis, I don't the, the most I do for eyeballs with like smaller minis, if I even want to do an eyeball is I'll just do like a little dot of like a very dark brown, typically, because uh, you can't really do like an iris or something like that. But with a big mini like this guy, uh, I always try to give him kind of a special eyeball. And if you look at, um, you know, how eyes are in the face, it's not just a big circle in the middle. Um, it's sort of a, uh, you know, you might see like the the bottom curve of the eye, but going up to the top, it sort of goes up into the, uh, the eyelid. So what I'm going to do first is kind of trace out how I want the eye to look. Another coat. And I'm just doing the lines of it first. Um, and if I mess up any of the lines, then I know I can just get my, uh, my off-white and cover up any of my mistakes. So I've got his line for his eye like that. I'm pretty happy with how that looks. I'm gonna go ahead and fill it in. And a lot of, um, a lot of mini painting, uh, Oft, very often I will uh, look at pictures of real life things that I'm sort of drawing inspiration from. So if you look at photos of eyes, you know, nobody's eye typically is just one solid color. There's a lot of depth, um, you know, there's lighter and darker bits in it. You know, maybe, maybe they've got like some brown or yellow or something like that. So I can go ahead and add those in um, and not completely cover it up, but just add like different little little speckles or something like that. I think that is a great start to his eye. Like already he's got a lot of character just by giving him a big eye that he's looking at you with. 
And I'm just going to go in and give a second coat. And let's see. I think I can probably go back to this guy that I was working on. And what I'm going to do is get uh, probably an orange. And then with the smaller brush, I'm going to go in for the on the corners um, of the yellow just to give it a little darker look. Just want to take this sunrise orange. Um, I have a ton of different paint colors, but you know, if you know basic color theory about mixing colors, you can, you know, you don't need to buy a bunch of colors that way. You just mix what you need. Uh, let's see. I'm going to get a very small brush. <laughs> And really, I'm just going for kind of the corners. And again, it's totally fine if I get out of the lines because I'm going to, I haven't painted his, his body yet. So, you know, it'll be fine to cover up later. So there's a question in the chat for you, Rachel. Um, mm -hmm. Do you put some kind of fixative spray over the paint once you're finished? I do. Um, and there's different things that you can use. Uh, so you, you would call it like a sealant. Um, I always go for a matte or like a flat sealant. Um, there are other kinds. You can get like shiny ones, but um, I usually don't want my minis to look shiny when I'm done with them. I want them to have like a flat cover. Um, you can typically get those kind of sealants. You can either get them in like a spray can form. Um, there's also like a brush on sealant. Uh, usually I only use that if um, maybe the weather is not nice and I can't go outside to spray anything. Because uh, usually you don't, if it's really wet outside, you don't want to take your minis out to try to spray them then because um, the, the moisture in the air can interfere with the, the spray, uh, which is why I'll, I will sometimes still use the, uh, the canvas primer that I have. Um, the downside with this though, is that it takes a while to dry. Um, but if my choice is either this, or I can't go outside to spray, then, you know, I'll use this, I'll prime a few and then wait maybe an hour or so to make sure that it's dried. Um, but typically, especially if you're going to use them a lot, uh, you do want to have like a seal on them because um, they can start chipping, uh, especially if, you know, you put them in like a bag or something that bumping around on the table, any sort of raised surfaces will start to get chipped. Um, and Rachel, I'm going to just do a time check because we have about nine minutes left, which I realize. Oh, sure just not very much time um i'm sorry <laughs> oh no it's um, fine but this has been just so cool to see this process um so maybe um i'm gonna see if any of the so i know the students in the classroom have mm -hmm. leapt in and i wanted to see if any of them had questions so it'll take probably a minute for their teacher to type in the chat but if sure. um mrs jones's classroom has has questions for you but also I was curious, so um, I don't know, I think it's, this is pretty fascinating that like, as you go, I'm realizing, oh yeah, the time here, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of time, but it's such a meditative process. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, but I was also curious, like when you're doing, so once you do like the bigger surfaces, which you're just starting. Mm -hmm. Is it usually all one color or are you, are you also, it seems like you have been putting in other, other colors into there to, to give it like shape or, or. Whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, like when I start, I definitely try to figure out a, a color scheme first. Um, so I try to figure out sort of the main colors I want to have. And, um, then uh, I'll look at, like, you can see he's very, see, he already looks like a pumpkin. 
Um, so I'll, uh, and you can, you can uh, like mix your colors. So uh, rather than um, like if I have a, a brown and a green and I want another color that's, that's kind of in between, rather than finding one that's already mixed, uh, what you can do to help give like your, uh, your mini sort of overall cohesion is just mix those colors that you already have on your palette rather than introducing new ones. Cause you don't want to have, you know, you don't want it to look like a, like a clown unless you're actually painting a clown. Um, so we do have a question about podcasting. Uh -huh. um, would you be willing to speak a bit about your podcast and maybe what it's like to be a podcast host? Oh, um, absolutely. I think also for me, I think that's such an interesting career piece um, too like another part of, of how to have a well-rounded life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the podcast I'm in is called Freelance Heroism. Uh, we are an actual play D&D &D podcast. Uh, what that means is that me and my friends, uh, we play D&D &D together and we record it. Um, and then uh, I'm actually also the editor <laughs> for the podcast. So I started out editing using uh, a free software called Audacity, which is a great beginner software if you're if you have any sort of interest in editing audio. Um, I recently moved over to Reaper software, which uh, is is more robust and also has video editing capabilities. Um, but we started out, uh, we just wanted to play together. Uh, we all thought we were pretty funny. So why not uh, make a make a podcast? Um, so we have it available through like uh, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio, um, you know, sort of everywhere that you can, you can find a podcast. We're probably, we're probably linked there. Uh, I typically look at, so when we started, I wanted to look at, um, you know, a release schedule. And I thought, um, I looked at, I considered what I look for in a podcast. So I didn't want to have an episode that was longer than an hour because with, when I listen to podcasts, um, you know, I think about an hour is like a good, a good time for me. So every week we release an hour long episode that's, you know, usually cut up from like a, a big three or four hour gaming block that we did. And, um, you know, we'll do uh, a little introduction for it that we record sort of a couple days before the episode is released. And um, I'll typically write up like a very quick kind of blurb about, oh, this is what happens in, in you know, this week's podcast. Uh, we have a, a Patreon, which has helped cover uh, our, our production costs, which is really nice. Um, and it's it's been a great project. I've honestly learned a lot from uh, audio editing, and it's really given me a, an appreciation for uh, things like sound effects and music and timing, which was something I never really had considered before I started editing or uh, even doing a podcast. Um, it's It's been really fun. Uh, usually I'm not the DM for that game. Uh, I, have, I also have another game that I play in person. I am the DM for that one. And so we use the minis. And then for the, the homeschool game, uh, I was the DM there but we'll sometimes sort of trade off on who's gonna host a game for you know a, a few sessions. Um, it's, been, it's been really fun. It is kind of surreal to have people uh, message us and comment about you know, whatever happened in the, uh, the recent game. Uh, we started playing maybe like three or so years ago, three or four years ago. And I made some like comment about my character and it immediately resulted in uh, me getting a nickname. I'd made a comment that my character was sort of following the rest of the party around like a like a duckling that had imprinted on them. And uh, from that moment on, uh, my nickname, both in the podcast and outside of it, when other people that I don't know message us about our podcast, is that they'll refer to me as Ducky. Uh, it's been it's been very weird, but it's it's definitely very cool. That's awesome. Um, the, the classroom teacher said um, they don't have questions, but they're actually preparing to take their minis with them into study hall. Oh, that's and, awesome. And that they're pretty delighted to have the minis um, from the kit. So thanks again to Sarah Taylor. Excellent. Um, well, 
I uh, I hope I can see the uh, the finished products. I yeah. I love to see other people's creativity and um, you know how they how they interpret you know what the the story is behind their mini or the color mm -hmm. scheme they want to do. There's some really fantastic stuff out there, and honestly, it's such a great hobby. Um, yeah. It does seem like there's a lot of creativity that takes place in what's the backstory of your character too, mm -hmm. that piece, yeah. um, which is so fascinating. Um, by the way, it would also be great when you're done this mini, which I know is going to take you a while, <laughs> you could, if you want it, if you would send us a photo of it um, eventually. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I can be done by <laughs> Halloween, but I yeah. will, I will definitely yeah. try um that's a, whatever works I feel like we could add it into the, the video at the end you know later sure. on too just, okay. just so people can see it all right let's see if I can get a cat cameo real quick I'm washed out because I have my light on <laughs> all right this is Horace oh Horace you're adorable oh. <laughs> He is a rescue. They found him as a kitten outside of the uh, the local PetSmart. Oh. oh, look at him. He likes whatever you're doing. He's like, oh, that's great. <laughs> this is on her, spelled A-N-H-U-R. He <laughs> is named after an Egyptian lion-headed god because <sighs> clearly he is a lion. <laughs> I love him. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rachel. That was awesome. Okay. Yeah, I feel like we could have made it much longer. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sarah, too. That was awesome. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Serena. And thanks so much for coming, Rachel. That was real. That was awesome. Good, good. I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me.